the Football Coaching Life, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and making media the podcast professionals. The Football Coaching Life is our opportunity to listen and gain insight from some of Australia's best male and female coaches, the people we entrust to develop our players and teams and look after the future of our game. We're absolutely honoured and it's a great pleasure today to invite Socceroos and Ollie Roos coach Graham Arnold. Now, Graham needs no introduction, albeit it's probably unfair if we don't pump up his tyres a little bit. No, nah, you don't need to, Coley. <laughs> Come on. We've known each other too long for that. But Arnie had a great, um, a great career as a player, both in the um, old NSL with, with significant careers in Holland over a couple of occasions in Belgium and then well over 60, 70 games for the Socceroos across a range of different coaches and I, and I really want to talk about that. And then an incredible journey as coach of the Olly Roos, as coach of the Socceroos, with good stints as assistant coaching through there as well. And I'm, the, the whole point of this show is really to talk about, not about games or, or tournaments mm. per se, but about your journey. And maybe we start by going, how, how, does, a, how does a senior national coach, an Olly Roos coach, deal with a, a year of COVID where you actually can't play and train games? Yeah, look, I think uh, you know, from the outside, I always try to be positive with every type of uh, occasion in every type of occasion, Coley. And, and, you know, I try to use this pretty much mentally as a half-time break. And, you know, I've been coaching now for 13 years and, you know, coaching is stressful and it's, and it's full on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, having a half-time break now, using COVID as, a, as an excuse and a reason and then, get ready for another 13 years and take me through to the late 60s and uh, and then uh, retire uh, very happily. But, uh, you know, I had the experience a little bit uh, of being in a bubble and I have to say uh, I'm not sure I'd really like that either. So yeah. <laughs> to be able to, uh, you know, sit back a little bit, we're monitoring players the whole time over in Europe and... Uh, Obviously, talking a lot with the with the boys overseas, and the most important thing when it gets down to the international side of things, there's certain things that we can't control, and that is the physical side of a player, um, the the tactical side of things is that 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 only happens when they come into camp. Um, uh, the technical side they have, that's why they're soccerers. So really, it's a mental side that we've got to get right when they come into camp, and and while they're at their clubs, as long as they keep working hard and playing a lot of minutes, then you know, the type of culture that I believe in and, and, and built is that uh, once a family gets back together, it's like we never left each other. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's what it is and we've got to get on with it. How's your use of Zoom developed over, the, over this period? Well, actually, to be honest, my technology has improved out of sight. <laughs> I've actually worked out how to use Zoom as well as Teams. Now, to have them on one computer, it's a miracle. <laughs> so I've been... Uh, yeah, plenty of meetings, plenty of meetings on these Zoom. I, I, I'll be honest with you, Cole, uh, Coley, I don't like them. I prefer face-to-face -face, uh, conversations with people and, and, and players and and that. And uh, and, you, and that way then you can really get the energy. You see the energy from the people when you're face-to-face. -face. But it is what it is. Uh, and, and we've just got to get on with it. Yeah. Arnie, you, you, obviously you've got the Socceroos and Ollie Roos. In addition to that, you've been giving... Uh, Trevor Morgan, who's the new um, national TD, a hand in, in looking at games for youngsters and, and the planning going forward. How, how's, what, what are the things that have really stood out for you through this time that you've had the opportunity to look at? Well, you know what? Uh, I really believe that in, you know, when there is a crisis, then you could, there's a reason to use it and, uh, and you have an opportunity to change things. And I just th I do believe that this COVID as bad as it is and as horrendous it's been on so many people and families and I, I, I just on the sporting side on our on our football side of things I think it's come at a perfect time that we've had this break in the game and been able to really sit down and have a real good look at where we're at because I have to say when I left in 2010 the national teams um it, it was it was well set up and things were you know very professional and uh, <clears throat> but when I, I have come back in 2018 and I walked in as a soccer coach and 
you know, there was an Olympic campaign about to begin in Gen- uh, uh, qualifiers, sorry, in, in March. And then, you know, I came in in September, October, and we didn't have a coach. It's quite hard to believe that you can just get a coach that can come in and then work for two weeks with a, a group of players, a bunch of strangers, and expect to uh, expect to get results. Yeah. And Asia's, Asia's getting tougher and tougher every year. So, you know, I think one of the things was I just uh, I looked at that and just instantly, you know, because of life experiences in coaching and because of, you know, the past where we played together in the middle 80s and, <laughs> and all that type of stuff, that I started looking back at what we used to do. What yeah. did we do that made our players great? And so I, I did a report uh, with my analysts that took three months. Uh, we call it the performance gap. And it was about giving some uh, knowledge to James Johnson and the board, but also to look at where things have gone wrong. And uh, it was quite horrifying reading when you mm-hmm. look at it. And, and it's, a, it's a complete just lack of opportunity to the kids, Australian yeah. kids. And uh, so, therefore, it's, it was something that uh, I devoted a lot of time of, uh, on in, during COVID, speaking to the state federations and speaking to a lot of people about what I believe we needed to do and how we needed to take this opportunity of COVID with, with no activity to get the, the structure right or to change things, to make things uh, more, uh, more for more opportunities for kids to get them to be able to play football, to create the next golden generation. Yeah. And it, it's almost like, Arnie, um, with the end of last season and, and the hub or, or bubble, whatever we called it, um, with the whole COVID thing, the, the blessing that has come of this is that, one, there's more Australian coaches coaching in the Hyundai A-League right now. Um, and there's probably more yep. young, talented young players getting more game time than at any time in the last 10 years. 100%. And, and this has happened by a coincidence. Mm. And we've got to stop that. It can't be a coincidence that because COVID hit and because there was a cut in the salary cap and because foreigners couldn't get out here or whatever, you know, it, it wasn't done with a strategy in place but now i think everyone's seeing it and 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 looking at it and saying okay these aussie kids they're good they give them an opportunity they're great you know and we we do live in a country where we've only got 11 professional clubs so there is limited opportunities for the for the kids in the a league the myl eight games of football in one season like it's 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 crazy that you'd even think of of having a competition. I don't call it a competition. I call that a tournament yeah. because there's only eight games in 12 months. And when you, when you start looking at the overall sport of football in this country, right from grassroots all the way up to professional, it's big bash football. And I say that in a way that, you know, you play NPL clubs, NPL one nearly all around Australia, 22 rounds. Mm. NYL, National Youth League, eight games. A-League, 26 games. We're nowhere near playing enough football as a sport, yeah. let alone giving kids an opportunity to, to have great football careers by giving them more opportunities when we only have 11 professional clubs in the whole country. Yeah, couldn't agree more. All right, enough with current affairs. Let's start to talk about your coaching <laughs> journey. You... Um, how did you get into coaching? How, were you? Did you stumble in? Were you pushed in? Did you jump in with two feet? Was it always something you wanted to do? It's funny, Kylie. You know, it's uh, it's probably something I didn't really set out to do. Um, I was playing in Japan at the time uh, under Eddie Thompson. I was thirty, I think it was thirty four, thirty five at the time, and I didn't really have a have a, my mind set on coaching, but. I got offered an opportunity from uh, Remo Nogarotto and, and Northern Spirit to be player coach. So if I can just say that um, before I go into all that, I, I probably am a very, very good example of doing my coaching career completely the wrong way, <laughs> upside down. <laughs> Being a player coach was really difficult mm. and my management skills were poor. My Everything that I was doing as a coach 
was poor. But I managed to be able to lead a team uh, on the field with my leadership as a player and, and being on the pitch as a player to, to, to help them, you know, play, play well. But everything else about it was wrong. And I learned, uh, I, I, when I was a uh, player coach here for a year and a half, two years, um, I felt, I, I really felt that I didn't want to coach after that experience, Northern Spirit. Uh, then Frank Farina got the national team job and he rang me up and uh, said, listen, I, I would, I'd love you to be my assistant. Um, and I then became assistant to the Socceroos and I thought that'd suit me more. That'd suit me better <laughs> yeah. just being an assistant, not having the pressure of coaching. And what I probably learnt in that period of time under Frankie and and uh, uh, before he, he moved on was, you know, with international football was, yeah, I do love the game and I do feel that I've got something to offer. But I really had to change my ways as a coach. Um, and, and because as a player, you know what it's like. As a player, you just think of yourself. Yep. You just think, okay, I've got to be fit. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And I want to be on the pitch and I want to play. And so you just think of one person. I wasn't used to thinking of other people. And so as an assistant coach, being there, being half mate, half coach, being a good cop, bad cop type thing, that uh, that sort of suited me. And and probably then with Gus Hiddink, uh, working with Gus, he taught me probably more in um, 12 months than I probably could have learned in 10 years. He was just his attention to detail, um, the way he planned everything was just. I felt like <laughs> I was building a house or something because he used to say all the time, "Listen, we've got to get the footings right. We've got to get the footings right. Then we can put the slab down, and then we can put the walls up. And then, you know, you can't think about the roof now. We've got to think about the footings." And and he and he used to say it in that way that it was it was really good. And say, so, okay, so he's again. His uh, attention to de detail was fantastic, tactically fantastic. Um, man management, I'll say, not that great yeah. at that time. He was fantastic to me, and you probably have heard some of the soccer boys say that he never really communicated with them. Yeah. But that was his way of getting the best out of them because he was only there sure, for a short time because he was coaching PSV, Eindhoven at the same time. Mm. But the one I learned a real lot from was Pimpa Bait. Yeah. And Pim was uh, uh, was such a gentleman. And for uh, Pim, it was all about communication. It was all about, you know, um, talking to the players, making sure they're okay. When they're at their clubs, communicating with them, even with a text message, how are you, is everything okay? And, you know, when they am working with them, that uh, it was uh, all about the team. So... That was that took me to 2010, and then you know I did the Olympic team. But I will say just quickly, Cole, Cole, my best, my best lesson I ever learned was the 2007 Asian Cup. I stuffed that up big time, <laughs> and I, I knew I had, but what I tried to do because I hadn't worked with Hus, uh, with with Pim, was I tried to manage the, the Hus hitting way, yeah, and that was very rigid, very hard, very, you know, the communication with the players, it was, you know, not, and I didn't deal with, I, I, I didn't have the power to deal with the big boys. And, and so there's, they're all lessons in life and, and you know, but uh, it was a, a good journey that 10 years of learning. Arnie, did you, did where, where did your formal coach education come into all this? When, when did you get your first coaching licence? Oh, geez, I think uh, in probably the late 90s, I would have had my A licence. Um, and then uh, I was on the first pro licence course here in this uh, in Australia for Asia. Yeah. And I did my uh, Europa, uh, European a, UEFA A licence in, in Europe, in, in London. So, you know, it's... Uh, and you know, it's always something like it's like driving a car. You've got to get that license to be able to to be able to be a coach. But the, the coaching courses that I did were were very good, and, and it was great to be there with a lot of players, ex players, and and people of my generation to do that. The, the I went through today because of your career as a player, um, 
with the Socceroos, um, uh, obviously your time in Holland, your time uh, with the national teams, the the Oliroos and the Socceroos. Um, Frank Herrick played a significant part of your Socceroo journey. Eddie Thompson would have been there. You would have finished yeah. with Terry Venables. Yeah. You've mentioned Gus. You've mentioned Pim. Um, I know you're good friends with Ronnie Smith along the journey. I'm not quite yeah. sure how, how Ronnie, what influence Ronnie's played on that journey. But is there... Have you learned from all of those people or is, is there one particular one that's had the most significant influence on you as a player or a coach? No, look, I, I've learned from every one of the coaches I've had right through my whole playing career. You talk about Frank Arrock and, and he was a, a, a marvellous coach and, and really gave me an opportunity in life. And he was one that believed hugely, as you know, in young kids. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about a guy there who was coaching the soccer A, a team, B team in St. George at once. And you think, how the hell did he do that? And But he's passion. And so you take away, what I took away from Frank Arrock was you needed to be fit to be at a top level yeah. because he trained us extremely hard in 1988 before the uh, the Olympics uh, and, and the World Cup qualifiers. He, mentally, he got into your brain and he made you feel 10 foot tall before you went on the pitch because he always never feared the opposition. It was we were as good as the opposition. He saw something in us that other coaches didn't see, and that was that we were physically strong and fit and we had a, a hard-working mentality that we could beat any team in the, in, in the world. Um, you know, and even play, even coaches I played under, Eric Gerrits in Belgium, uh, you know, he's a, was a... A fantastic coach, uh, Wim Reisberg, and in, when I was in Holland, was a fantastic coach as well. But I also I get out, and you know, I, I'm quite close with Wayne Bennett. I get on very well with Wayne Bennett in rugby league, and Trent Robinson at, at the Roosters, and I've been to see John Lemire and, and Kevin Sheedy, and because coaching is the is all the same. Yeah. It's, the sport might be different, the rules might be different. The ball might be a different shape, but coaching is all the same. So to be able to move around and, and, and speak to those type of coaches in this country, uh, you learn a lot from everybody. And it's at the end of the day, you have your own style and on, on coaching, but it's what you, what you learn from other coaches that you, that you think will fit into your style and being flexible in your thinking makes all that happen. You're listening to the Football Coaching Life, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. Today's guest is Socceroos and Oliroos coach Graham Arnold. We're, we're blessed to have Arnie with us today, wandering down memory lane and, and, and right now talking about the, the coaches that have influenced him as a player and as a coach. Um, and you've done a great job here, Arnie, as you've gone on. You've pre, you've sort of, I'm sure I must have given you my questions because you've answered all my questions in, adv in, in advance here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I love... It's a quick podcast. <laughs> I love... I'll ask you some questions. Uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Nothing to learn here. Um, the, what is coaching? Well, coaching's teaching. Coaching's... In my view, the way I like to manage the coaching is like being a father to, to, to those kids or to those players. And, and, you know, I think that the old days of probably just coaching of being a very good coach on the football pitch and having great training sessions, great tactics, that's now probably a tenth of the job. Mm. And you know, it's not long ago I did a coaching wheel so I was at home during COVID and I just started thinking about things. And I read a great book on, on uh, you know, and that's what I have been doing through COVID is looking at where I can improve as a yeah. coach and reading books about, you know, the mental side of things and, uh, you know, the subconscious mind and the wording, the affirmations that you're saying to players and all those type of things that, that really can, you know, goes into the, the player's brain. But, you know, the coaching these days is, again, it's just not about football. That's probably one, if I, if I say, said like this, if you've got a, a pizza and you put eight slices in pe the, that pizza, it's all about trying to get all those pizzas sizes, slices, sorry, the same size. And, you know, and each, each slice of that pizza could have six or seven pieces to that subject. And, and it, 
and it goes from coaching the, to the to the training sessions, the tactical side, and your style to recruitment. And the recruitment's a big part of of, of success. Recruiting yeah. the right now, people will say first and foremost, recruit the right players. We recruit the right players. Well, I believe in recruiting the right people because if you have the right staff that are very good at their job, but they're the right people, then they are your brothers. You can trust them like brothers. And in this, in, in the caper of coaching, this is something that needs to be very strong. It's a trust that you have in your staff that if one day you can't turn up for training or one day you're sent off and you're up in the grandstand or you're ill, that everything goes normal. It's clockwork. And that's the way I, I like to do it. Now, you know, and then it goes to politics and being able to deal with politics in the boardroom, in the dressing room, crises. How do you deal with a, a, a dressing room crisis with a player? How do you deal with a boardroom crisis, a fan crisis, a media crisis? And then it goes into media. How do you deal with media? Now, probably five years, four years ago, my, my slice of the pizza for media was, you know, from quarter past three to about 18 past three. And, and I had to do a lot of work. And I, I went and, and had, you know, some great chats with people about that on how to deal with, you know, making myself better in public, but yep. also on the media side and how to deal with media. So there's pro- there's, now there's not just a matter of just turning up and coaching. And, and when I say that, as I said, turn up, whistle in the hand, go on the pitch, great training session, great game plan. Because the, the way players are these days and people are these days is that it's all about the brain. It's all about the mind. It's how you get into their mind. It's how you get them to perform. Because if players don't want to do it, it's like anybody. If someone wakes up in the morning and they don't want to go to work or they don't want to walk down the street or they don't want to drive, they're not going to do it. Well, they're not going to do it with passion. And so to get players happy and to get them to come into training to, to, with a lot of energy and, and you know, and, and enjoying what they're doing is, is the most important thing. Yeah. Arnie, you, um, you, with your first stint with the Socceroos, you, you ended up back in the A-League with, um, uh, God, I metal blank there. Um, with yeah. Central Coast, with the Mariners, of course, uh, and then uh, Sydney FC winning championships and premierships at both of those places. What, what's the difference for you coaching the the national teams where you see the players so irregularly, and and the joy, uh, hopefully, of of working with players at clubland um, each and every day. Well, the the biggest thing I miss is the day to day work with the players and. Uh, when you're with the player day to day, you build relationships, you, you, you build trust, you, you build, you know, a real good camaraderie. And, you know, when I, like, for example, when I was at the Mariners, for me, at the Mariners, it was all about the underdogs. And it was about giving the players a belief to, to create something special. And team spirit, for me, the team spirit, the team is number one, not the player the individual has to come second in this then it's about the person and once you get the that that relationship right with the person the player so for me the person is number one the player is number two once you get that right the player will automatically become number one because you know uh, to to help the players and to get the players and help them become uh, have great careers is obviously something that is special for them you're doing it for them but also then you get rewarded at the end. When probably that first year I was at the Mariners, I wanted to prove everyone wrong. <laughs> it was all about me, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. Yeah, right? I, know. I appreciate and it. And it was like yeah, I went from I coached the Olympic team. We qualified in 2008. I was assistant to PIM. I was still copping uh, smashing from the 2007 Asian Cup. And, you know, I wanted to go back to club football and it was all about proving everyone else wrong. And I got it right by the second year. Well, you know, the first year we got the grand final, we got beat in the grand final penalty shootout yep. uh, against Ange up there in Brisbane. And then the second year I started feeling, I don't want to be like this person anymore. I don't want to be this, you know, hard on people. I'm not that type of person in real life. Yeah. 
I want to be that person I am in real life. And as I said, I then started leaning more towards more the supportive way, the coaching, teaching way, and being there to help every individual personally and professionally. And I probably nailed it when we couldn't, they couldn't afford the Mariners at that time to pay our wages for a few weeks. And I paid myself, I paid for the, the lawnmower to put petrol in it to cut the ground, <laughs> the grass at the ground. And I paid some of the boys rent. Yeah. And what they returned me with was, what I got back from that was just enormous. Mm. And they would run through brick walls for me. And then we ended up obviously winning the competition and, and you know, doing something that that club would never have thought they could have achieved. So three years you finished in the top two um, each year, um, premiership, championship, and, and, you know, nowhere near the budget that you then rolled into with Sydney FC. Mm. Do, do you, yeah, do you... look, I think it, it was, it's always about the identity of the club. And, and what the club expects or wants. So when I went, went in the Central Coast Mariners, we had a chairman, Peter Turnbull. And Peter Turnbull come and met me and said, Arnie, I want you to come and coach the Mariners, uh, but we need to su sell to survive. I don't care if you don't win the competition. What I, what I want you to do is help develop kids, which yeah. I know you're passionate about. And if we win a competition with them, fantastic if we don't long as we sell players and you're open to selling players developing players so we can sell them so we can survive the central coast mariners because we don't have those budgets that other clubs have so i was using the bottom of the salary cap and laurie mckenna before me did a great job uh, honestly great job in the recruitment yeah. so when i walked in in the in the youth team bernie abini mitchell duke matty ryan Mustafa Amini, uh, Anthony Caceres, the list goes on. Yeah. They were already there. But it was then I was sort of put in a position by the chairman at the time of, uh, well, these kids need to be given a go and we need to try and sell. Then we got Tommy Rogic come up. So, But the, the most important thing for me then was, okay, great, and it's like now with the kids playing in the A-League. It was about giving the kids the opportunity. But I had you, you have to get the blend right the mix right. You can't just have 10 young kids on the pitch and one older player or 10 old, one young. It was about getting the blend. So yeah. we had some five, four or five young kids on the pitch and then you had the Alex Wilkinsons, Hutchinsons, McBreen, uh, Patrick Zwanswijk, Josh Rose, some older players around them that could be mentors to them and then on match day out on the pitch be there to support them. Yeah. When you, when you, um, finally moved on up to Sydney FC. Uh, obviously, a big club, more pressure, more expectation, maybe closer to the, the similar sort of feel of being in and around the national teams. How, how did, did did you notice that? Did you feel that there was a difference when you when you moved on? That there was a a, a, a more significant um, expectation of you? Oh yeah, of course. And and again, it's like when I walked into Sydney FC, uh, I sat in the boardroom and. Scott Barlow and the board said, we don't need to sell players. We need to win trophies. It's all about winning trophies. It's, it's, we don't sell. You know, we've just had Del Piero here. Del Piero was probably, he was my first decision at Sydney <laughs> of whether to stay or let him go. Yeah. And I just felt, I went and had a look at their facility. I looked at how they were working with it. And I, I went and met some players that I knew before I actually took the job to see, okay, what's the environment, what's the dressing room and, and, and all that like. And Del Piero had his own dressing room. And I'm thinking, how can you have a team with someone that has their own dressing room? Yeah. And uh, so what was important for me was that was reconnecting. I, I inherited a squad uh, from, and you always do that with mm. uh, when you take over teams. And, and it was all about, you know, getting the senior players on side and telling them what we wanted and how it was going to work. And then, and then, you know, at Sydney at the time, the, at the training facility, they didn't even have a coach's office. And, you know, I was like, come on, there has to be an office where we can have private conversations. You put a wall up uh, through the middle of the building there uh, to have a, a coach's office. And then it was about getting the resources right and then having getting the chef in and having breakfast and lunch available because those type of things 
really build team unity because players then will turn up earlier and they'll start communicating more, you know, before training, after training, compulsory lunch. Breakfast wasn't, but compulsory lunch. And then they're all sitting there still at three o'clock in the afternoon having a laugh, playing cards and doing all that stuff, which then builds a great team environment. But yeah. the expectations of Sydney was obviously much higher. But again, I always believe that in myself, first and foremost, but if you get the, the main things right of what you can control, you know, you can't control many, many things in coaching outside of that dressing room and outside yeah. of that environment. So the most important thing for me was, again, I go back to the wheel was recruitment recruitment of very good staff recruitment of people i could trust and knew that they would work hard and they were great at their jobs and then even with player recruitment again for me the first thing i in in a play when i recruit a player i can watch him on tv i can watch him on the uh, watch him live you know i can watch a highlights reel of him and i can see he's a good player but for me the most important thing is what's he like as a person yeah and if that and getting that right and the first thing is, like I'd said to Milos Ninkovic, okay, when you come out to Australia, if you come out, if I don't play play you, how are you going to react? Uh, well, I'm here for the team coach. I will work hard at training. And, you know, it, then if I don't play, I must have, there must be a reason I'm not playing and I'd like to speak to you about Okay. If, you know, if Bobo, if you don't score, or if Matty Simon's playing and you, and you don't, sc- and you're on the bench and he scores, how, do you, how will you react? I just want the team to win, coach. So once they start answering just that, a few of those yeah. questions, then you see what type of person they are. And and then you see straight away they come out with their families and they're brilliant people, got great families, and, and they fit into the family environment that, uh, for me, is so special at clubs and club football. You're listening to The Football Coaching Life, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. Today's guest is Graham Arnold. And we're having a, a great walk down memory lane with some great knowledge and wisdom that Arne is sharing. Graham, can I continue with Sydney FC? Um, yep. I, I'm, I know at that time, I think you brought in uh, Mike Conway from X Venture yep. and, and really started to work in and around players' minds and their thinking. Was that a first for you? Um, and, and I know that rolled also into the Socceroos yep. Uh, yep. later. How, how did that come about? And what were the well, benefits? I looked, uh, I went away. I had one bad season in the A League. That's one time I, the only time I didn't make the top two uh, or, or win it, and that was we came seventh and we missed the top six. And I was more focused on that year, the Champions League. And, <clears throat> you know, I got that wrong. Yeah. So another lesson. Um, and, uh, I just sat sat down one day and I, I started thinking about the, f- the four main pillars in, 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 in life and in football and technical, tactical, physical, mental. And obviously there's the set piece side of things, man manager, all that. But I then started thinking, well, there's only one thing that I think that at this moment I can't really be good at and that is the mental side. Tactically, I think my game plan most times gets a result or works. I'm, I'm flexible. I'll change it if it's not working and, and that. So the technical side, yeah, the training sessions, I think, are, and the players will all say that they're enjoyable and they're good. And 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 the physical side, I had Andrew Clark doing that and, and I know that he always gets the players extremely fit and healthy. And then I started thinking about the mental side. and And that decision probably changed me completely as a person and, and changed me as coaching is that when you have quality players, which I believed we had in, in the year that we come seven, we still had good players. They can't lose their quality and their talent overnight. Yep. And so there has to be something that's not right. So it's either you look at, again, whenever something's not right, the first that we lose, the first thing I do is look in the mirror at myself and what I did that week and did I do the wrong thing myself. <clears throat> and we had players that were Milos Dimitrovic and Tavares and Jacques Fati who played in the French top division in, in, in top league in France and, and Turkey and top players, Alex Brosk and, and Philippe Holosko, very good players. How can you underperform? How can you underachieve with that team? 
And, and I went back and I looked at a lot of the things that I did during that year and, and I just felt that, if anything, mentally I didn't get into their brains. I, I wasn't stimulating them enough. And <clears throat> players don't like to, you know, they don't like to go to a coach and say, oh, you know, only I've, you know, my, my wife's sick or my girlfriend's not well or I'm having trouble at home in the relationship. They don't want to, uh, or they're not feeling right injury wise. They're never going to, every time you say to a player, how do you get a, uh, such, how do you feel today? They all say great. Yeah. They all say great. So it was more about then getting someone, I didn't really at, at the time want a psychologist. I wanted someone like a, an emotional intelligence coach that could, B- help build the, a team identity of what what the team stood for yep. as a group of people and also about someone that could communicate with them if they didn't feel comfortable coming to me um and it worked great it, it worked did. it worked great and mike uh mike uh, did that role very well with the players um we built a, a very good uh team identity we ended up uh doing a jigsaw puzzle of that identity there was 23 pieces in it one one time david carney slipped up i pulled one piece out chucked it on the floor and said we're broken you know we, we we've lost one yeah. and everyone's looking and you know he can't and he apologized for his behavior put the piece back in right we're back together off we go and uh but it's it's uh yeah it, it's something that is for me is so special now in elite sport because of social media. Yep. You know, I, I don't do it. Social media, I don't look at it. I don't know how to use it, and I uh, and I don't want to. So, but young people these days, oh, you know, they're addicted to it, and they, yep. they get affected by it badly. And when you see sometimes players looking at their phones at half time and that to see what people are thinking about their first half performance, that's when you start thinking, okay. Well, I need to get. I don't have that time to to uh, designate so much time on looking at all that. So I've got, you know, I've got 23 players to keep happy. I've got a whole staff. I've got the board. I've got, and so that's why I made that decision. I've learned a lot, yeah. and uh, you know, and with the national team, you know, it's it's I'm in touch with the players all the time and communication, and, and that is the key. And you know, Danny Vukovic, for example, just quickly, is. You know, he went through a period when he came to Sydney of his son uh, had to have a liver transplant. Yeah. Now, I'm just saying how I would have been before <laughs> compared to <laughs> what, what I am now and was then. But it probably I would have, uh, uh, what I would have been like in 2010 when it was all about me. And, you know, we've got to win, we've got to win. You know, if his son is ill, well, don't come. Stay home, just don't come. Yeah. You know, where... Uh, with Danny, with uh, at the older uh, when 2017 and 18, and he was marvelous. I said, "You train when you want to train. If you don't want to play, you don't need to play. We understand your son is the most important thing in life. So you do what you want. And and you can train with John Crawley at whatever time you want. You don't need to be here, mate. We we will we we love you. We know how good you are. Just look after your son." Yeah. He slept on the floor in the hospital for six weeks. He turned up to training a couple of times a week. He flew in and out match day, which is totally against sports science. <laughs> he flew in and out match day to play the game. And in the six weeks so he was he was doing that, we conceded one goal. Remarkable. And he played unbelievable. But his gratitude to what we allowed him to do paid us back. And because of that nature, that wasn't impacting the thinking or it wasn't impacting the culture because the culture was that, you know, we're, we're as strong as one another and, and we're yeah. going to do what needs to happen to get the job done and understand. Yeah, we're, a fam- we're a family. We, we, we respect each other. We're brothers. Yeah. And everyone in life has, in my view, in football and, and everything, is there's two families. There's one you have at home and there's one that you work with. And if that environment's right, well, then you will go the extra yards, you'll do that extra more to help each other, which is which is the key. You've had some wonderful experiences and, and I just love that. That that story is just, um, uh, just, just hits the spot. Uh, and maybe your motivations change, but why do you do it? 
Why are you still coaching? There's this stupid <laughs> drug in my body, <laughs> and it's called football. <laughs> I just love it. It's just, you know, I said I said to my wife uh, in 2010 when I was, you know, going into coaching back at the Mariners, I said, you know, my wife often says to people, he's married to football and he's having an affair with me. <laughs> and I think that's a really good way of her putting it because, uh, you know, you've just got to, you, you've just got to have that passion to do it, you know, and, and it's just such a brilliant sport and it's just given me, you know, such a great life. And, you know, I remember saying to the Mariners boys, kids up there, I'll judge my performance on how many millionaires I make. That's my job, is to make you boys millionaires. There's plenty of them. I'm still waiting for the beer. They, they, they said they'd buy me, but uh, there's plenty of them. But it's, it's, just, it's just given me such a great life. And, and if I could give another 50 kids the life I've had over the next 10 years, I'll be delighted. Yeah. Know, for me, that's what it's about. Terrific. Changing tack just a little bit, the the your relationship with the media, you've you've experienced being appointed as a coach, being sacked as a coach, national team jobs, taken away, um, being smashed around by the media. How important has it been for you to develop resilience as a coach? Yeah, that's uh, you got to have thick skin, uh, very thick skin. Um, I don't. I don't read newspapers. I read the English newspapers, crazy. But I don't. Uh, I couldn't tell you what they're writing or what they're saying, because I learnt a long, long time ago uh, when I was a player that, you know, half of them probably don't yet yeah, have not even kicked a ball in their life yeah. themselves, and they have a job to do. And so I have to respect. In the last number of years, as I said, that slice of the pizza has got bigger because I've learned that I know that they've got a job to do. And they're all, 99% of them are all good people. They've just got a job to do. And their job is to feed their family. Their job is to look after their family. And they've got to write headlines and create headlines. So and if I'm that headline and they can get the money and they've got a job and, and that, well, that's, that's, that's the way it is. But you've got to have thick skin. You've got, you've got to be able to, cop criticism you've got to be able to walk away from people if they say something in the street to you, you just laugh at them and walk away and and that's that's just part of coaching but uh i wouldn't want it any other way because yeah. I, I, to be honest i don't think i've really ever had anyone come up to me right up to my face and say you know give me a, a mouthful yeah. <clears throat> about you know me as a player as a coach you know it's 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 just the way life is but everyone has an opinion and you know, in the old days, as you know, Coley, there was four opinions, SBS and three newspapers. <laughs> hey, now, everyone's got social media, everyone's got Everyone's opinion. an expert. So what can you do? You, you touched on uh, managing up earlier on in the conversation, and I just wonder how important you found that and, and how you've changed in your capacity to... You know, you lead the players, you're, you're the boss in, in some instances, in some cultures that the coach is the boss and that's the way it's looked up. But how have you grown and developed in terms of managing up, managing the CEO and the board and the chairman? Yeah. First of all, I, I don't let the, I've never let the players call me Gaffer or the boss. Yeah. It's Arnie and I'm there to help. I'm not there to, you know, rule with fear or to scare them or or, you know, to dictate to them on what this has to happen and this needs to... First and foremost, I'm there to, to support and help them become great players or and great people. Um, managing up, I found that the best way to manage up is making yourself attend and be available for, for board meetings. You know, and because sometimes, you know, the truth doesn't get to the board or the truth doesn't get to the chairman. It stops halfway. And then the board hear a completely different story. And if there's any type of uh, incidents that do occur, it's always they get second or third hand information. So at Sydney, for example, I used to invite myself to board meetings, you know, once a month, I'd go there, sit down. They, if they had any questions for me, 
no problem at all. Any right, wrong, I'd tell them. Uh, and being honest is, is the most important thing. So to have communication with the board is, I think, is, is very, very important because, mm. as I said, if you don't communicate with them, they, they don't get to know you. If you don't, they don't get to know you, they just judge you as you know, an isolated person and, and they make decisions on what other people are saying about you, not what they know about you. So, you know, going to board meetings there, yeah, I do, you know, I've been to a couple of board meetings at FFA yeah. as well because, again, I want them to hear from me. If they have any issues, I want to be the one to tell them. I'd rather, again, not to be secondhand news. Oh, I love it. What have been your most enjoyable moments as a coach? Um, most enjoyable moments as a coach is every game you win. <laughs> you know, I love. I'm, I'm just a winner. I just, you know, if I lose, if we lose, I can't sleep for two nights and two days. And uh, you know, I'm grumpy and I don't, you know. But I, I did learn a very good lesson from Goose Hitting, and that was. When you win, you can be grumpy, and when you lose, you've got to be happy. Completely opposite, because the players know they've lost, and you've got to pick them up quickly and straight away and get on with the next game. But uh, what makes me happy is just the sport and just being involved and just being able to do uh, do what I do and, and being on the field and coaching kids. I just, you know, I really got so much joy out of coaching that Olympic team this year. This, mm. uh, uh, this time last year in Thailand and working with Australian kids you know it's uh, I had an offer to go to South Korea just not long ago and my gut just wouldn't let me go because I just didn't want to let down yeah. you know these kids that I've started at this journey with with the Olympic boys and with the Socceroo boys that uh, you know what's going to what's going to be in front of us is going to be quite uh, obviously different and difficult but I'm there to help I'm there to you know, help those kids uh, fulfil their dreams. Love it. You're listening to The Football Coaching Life, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. We're with Graham Arnold, Socceroos and Ollie Roos coach right now. And Arnie, we're on the, uh, we're on the home straight here. A Cup, couple of questions to go before, we're, before we let you go. No I d- problem. I did notice today that you've got a street named after you called Arnold's Pl- Arnold Place in Glenwood. What, what's that like? Is it a bit like a ship? Do they, do they sort of um, throw a bottle of champagne at it and launch it, or did it just happen without you being there? No, no, I was uh, I was there, but I think it was a drain. I think, uh, <laughs> my street ended up the drain. <laughs> it's where the sewer goes straight down. <laughs> it's a sewer part of the of the, of the uh, community. <laughs> oh. no, it's uh, it was a great honor, great privilege down at the, it's just at uh, Valentine Park there and at the Park Lee many many years ago it happened. I can't even tell you what year it was. I think it was when I was playing. So it's yeah. been out there for years and around some other great uh, you know some other great legends of the game who played out there and were part of the New South Wales. So it's a great honor. Yeah, how good was it to be on that open top bus in Gosford? After you won the championship with the Mariners, yeah, it was great. Uh, yeah, no, that was it was fantastic because uh, we didn't, you know, we had to go straight after the grand final, and we had to go play a Champions League in South Korea, a game in South Korea, um, and I don't know how we won that, but we won. Yeah. We beat Sue and Blue Wings one nil, and uh, two days after we played Sunday grand final, uh, went back, went after we won straight to the hotel at the airport. Flew out the next day, played Suwon on the Tuesday, come back on the Wednesday. And for the Friday, I think it was Thursday or the Friday, was the, um, you know, the parade and it was the, and the celebrations. By that time, I thought, you know, most people on the Central Coast would have forgotten about it by then, four or five days later. But we had a great roll up and uh, it was probably one of the biggest things that's ever happened to the Central Coast. Central Coast, you know, the club and the Mariners has got a special place in my heart for them it's uh, such a fantastic club i'd love to end up back there one day and uh great people on the coast and uh to give them something that was so special and to help with those players it was fantastic yeah on the you spoke before about the cup the football coaches that have influenced you some of the people outside the sport that have influenced you have you ever had someone that you've said that's my mentor that they're, they're the 
the sage, the person that I bounce ideas off? Or have you got one of those or more than one of those that you've used over the journey? Um, I know people probably think I'm just going to say this, but Ronnie Smith has been a huge influence. Um, you know, when we were with the national team together under Frank Farina and Goose Hitting, the conversations we would sit and have till 2 a.m. in the morning <laughs> talking about football was crazy, and we did that for years. Um, and, you know, he's, he's always he's taught me the what-if scenarios, and that's when I say that, it's about plan A, B, and C, and D, of what happens if this happens in the game. So he was one of the first ones to introduce me to that. And, you know, so if ever I have any type of thing I'd like to talk about football, Ronnie's one of the first ones I pick up the phone to and, and we, you know, it's never a 10 minute chat. You know that. Guy. No, I do indeed. It's uh, two hours. <laughs> um, yeah. So that uh, here in Australia, probably I still keep in touch with Gus um, quite often. And, uh, you know, if there's anything major to talk to about him with my career or anything, then I'll, I'll speak to him. But uh, here in Australia, probably Ronnie. Yeah. Another wise man. Have you taken on the role of mentor? People like Phil Moss and, and Bimby at Sydney FC and Clarkie and uh, Vid, Viddy. Uh, uh, do they look to you for uh, advice? You've obviously helped them on their journeys. Yeah. Look, I, when you're actually doing it, you don't realise you're doing it. Mm. And, you know, showing leadership or support or and, and when they ask you for advice, you just give them your opinion back because of the experiences you've had in life and, you know, and I always say that is that you know, not everything can be rosy all the time, and especially in coaching. You learn every day, every day. And, and you know, I had a great uh, – I've sat uh, – I spent a week at Manchester United with Sir Alex Ferguson and, and Mourinho. I spent a couple of hours with him and, and Brendan Rogers when he was at Celtic. And everyone says the same. Coaching's tough. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's a tough gig. And, you know, it normally only lasts at one club for two years and then you've got to move on. It's, it's not a lifetime job with a, a lot of people have in life. So to be able to, to mentor, look, I, it's more mateship, if anything, Coley. You know, yeah. that I have some coaches ring me up and ask me about their coaching career and what they should do next. I'm, I'm just here with the knowledge that I have to, to help. I would never tell anyone what decision you have to make. It's more about, you know, talking through a, a few different experiences. But, you know, Phil Moss, uh, you know, he's, he was a, he's a great mate today. He's uh, one of my best mates and he was a great assistant coach for me up at the Mariners. And, you know, and, and his love for football is, is, is huge as well. And, and uh, you know, when you work with mates and, and Clarkie and John Crawley and these guys, it's very, very easy to be a so-called mentor or you're more of a friend. Yeah. And you're always there to, to help them if you can as a mate. Good on you, mate. Final one for the day. If you had one piece of wisdom you could share with coaches, what would it be? Believe in yourself. It's tough. Coaching, is, it's not easy. Um, believe in your way and do it your way. And, you know, be flexible in the way you think. But at the end of it, enjoy every day, every moment of it, because it is tough. It is a tough gig, but when you enjoy it, then it's not so tough. It's 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 not a job. It's it's a hobby. I love it. I love it, mate. And and I have to say that from the outside in, um, it looks like you you so. Much, I can remember at the beginning of your career, you sort of kicked every ball and headed every ball and wanting to wrestle in challenges from the side and. Yeah. I think you still kick a few balls now and again on the touchline, but you, you, you really do look like you've settled in and, and understand who you are and really are enjoying it. So congratulations yeah, to you. It's, as I said, it's, uh, you learn in life and as you get more and more experience, then as a young coach, you're going to make mistakes. Don't beat yourself up when you make mistakes yeah. because that's what a lot of coaches do. You know, it's, it's what you learn. If you make a mistake, learn from the mistake, move on straight away and don't, as I said, don't beat yourself up because, you know, sometimes you can't control the weather. Sometimes you can't control a send-off, you know. Yeah. It's, it's all different. But what you can control is, is your own behaviour and, 
and and what you do and and how you manage people and that's the most important thing great place to finish graham thanks very much it's been a, an honor and a privilege to have you on today to share your coaching life and your your journey and your wisdom you've got that gray hair and the whiskers now so <laughs> plenty of wisdom around so oh, i forgot i forgot to mention that's the one last one last meant thing if you become a coach, expect to lose your hair <laughs> <laughs> or, or go grey. Now I'm looking at one. <laughs> uh, really appreciate your time, Arnie. Um, good luck um, with the Olympics. Let's hope that happens in the Olly Roos yeah. uh, w w with a terrific talent coming through now. Um, good luck um, with qualifying for the next uh, FIFA World Cup. Um, two, two huge tasks. So our yeah. thoughts and prayers yeah. are with you, mate. Thanks very much. We will. Thanks very much and uh, great to see you, great to speak to you and uh, thanks for all your support uh, during my coaching. Thank you. Good on you, Arnie. You've been listening to Graham Arnold on the Football Coaching Life podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media the Podcast Professionals. If you've enjoyed today's podcast or you want to find out more information about Football Coaching Australia and how they can help you, please go to footballcoachingoz.org.au. Have a great day and enjoy your coaching.